Welcome to the Egalitarian Connection, your connection to Christians of Biblical Equality, Archaeology, and the Persecuted Church. Are you ready for another scintillating video from the Christians for Biblical Equality's Marriage Conference 2000, Ordinary People, Extraordinary Marriages? The title of this excellent video is Beyond Sexual Stereotypes, uh, How Biblical Equality Leads to Greater Intimacy, uh, in marriage with Ruth Haley Barton. Stereotypes often oversimplify the complexity of human experiences and prevent us from having our truest selves, be, bring our truest selves to our relationships. Ruth Haley Barton explores the ways in which biblical equality moves us beyond stereotypes to a full expression of individuality and sexuality within marriage. Ruth Barton is the Associate Director of Spiritual Formation at the Willow Creek Community Church in Barrington, Illinois. She has written two books, Becoming a Woman of Strength, Strength and uh, Equal to the Task, Men and Women in Partnership, as well as Bible study guides, magazine articles, and contributions to the Couples the Devotional Bible, the Woman's Ministry Handbook, and the Bible for Today's Christian Woman. She's a graduate of Wheaton College, and she is, Ruth is a spiritual director trained through the Shalem Institute for Spiritual Formation in Washington, D.C. Ruth Barton has worked on a variety of teams in the church and organizations, organization settings, including serving as the president of the Chicago chapter of Christians for Biblical Equality. She and her husband, Chris, have three children. Now let's watch this video on stereotypes and sexuality with Ruth Haley Barton. Well, that long title in your bulletin um, is just our way of saying that in this session we're going to talk about sex. <laughs> and what is a marriage conference without sex anyway? And I feel like I definitely lucked out because I got the best topic, or at least the topic with the best research possibilities. <laughs> And I have to admit that my husband took full advantage of this whole situation in a very stereotypical fashion. He said, Ruth, I want you to go fully prepared, having fully researched your topic, and I want you to go fully uh, full of integrity. I want you to be able to say that you have lived deeply everything that you're saying in your message while you're there. <laughs> uh, I guess some things will never change, because it is strange that he doesn't show quite that level of enthusiasm for everything that I talk about. <laughs> Oh dear. Well, we want to narrow the topic of sexuality just a little bit and talk about how biblical equality enhances our ability to be intimate with one another. Because I believe that biblical equality does enhance marital intimacy because it moves us beyond stereotypes to a place where two people can show up more and more with the truth of who they are, right? Can show up more and more fully with the truth of who they are rather than being defined by narrow descriptions that are based on the way the culture or the church or their family of origin has defined them perhaps up until that time. Marriage is the opportunity to be accepted and to be received as our truest selves. Isn't that true? That would be a good definition of intimacy in my mind. To be able to show up, to, be, to give and to receive based on who you most truly are. And this is the heart of true intimacy. And then that intimacy, that intimacy of giving and receiving who we most truly are, can be expressed in the physical sexual act. And it ought to go in that order, by the way. We should show up with the, all the truest aspects of ourselves, and then sexuality, the sex act, becomes the culmination of the expression of our intimacy together. Now, the flip side of the coin is that if we're hiding behind stereotypes, if we are afraid to let our true selves show, we can become frustrated with certain aspects of our relationship. And we had such a powerful example of that this morning in Jim and Leanne's story. That because Leanne was not able to show up fully as who she was, Jim was having a grand old time, right? Because he was all the way there as the Olympic athlete and the great leader and all that kind of thing. Leanne was busy trying to fit into a stereotypical view of things. And she was deeply frustrated. And beyond frustration, it got to the point where it was sad and depressing and debilitating. So that's the possibility that there is. 
as we become more and more frustrated then with those aspects of our relationship where we feel like we can't show up all the way because we're limited by either our own understanding of what it means to be whatever gender that we are, or maybe we're frustrated by the other person's limited idea of what our gender ought to bring to the relationship, then it becomes more and more difficult to show up fully in the sex act. Isn't that right? Because if the sex act is the culmination of our intimacy in all those other ways, if we're not able to show up fully as who we are and if we're hiding behind stereotypes or not able to receive one another fully, then the sex act becomes difficult as well because it's hard to show up there all the way as well. And I remember my experiences as a young wife where early on in our marriage, for the first year, things were just fine. But when the children started to come along and we started to settle into the more stereotypical roles where I was at home with the children and Chris was out um, developing his career as a banker and doing very well with that, and I was feeling more and more frustrated about the limitations of our relationship, I found that my sexual interest was diminishing as well because I wasn't happy being a woman. And if there's one thing that you need to have for good sex, you need to be happy with being a man or happy with being a woman, right? Because that's the place where you show up as one or the other. <laughs> <laughs> and so you wanna feel really good about being a woman so that you can show up all the way as a woman in the sex act. And you wanna be, feel really good about being a man so that you can show up all the way as a man when you're involved sexually with your mate. And so these things run together then, whether or not we are freed up all the way to be everything that we're meant to be in God, that has a great deal of impact on whether or not our sexual relationship is fulfilling as well. Um, Ann Burke, who is the director of sex therapy at a program in Boston, says that one of the major predictors of sexual dysfunction in women in particular is chronic and unexpressed anger. And in this whole thing about stereotypes, anger is one of the primary emotions that a woman begins to experience if she's brave enough to say that she's feeling it. Now, anger is not that acceptable of an emotion for women, so it might be hard to, to actually admit the fact that she's feeling that way. But when a woman or a man feels that they are not free to be who they are, there is a sadness and there is also an anger. And so um, Ann Burke says that when women are angry with their husband or their boyfriend or there is unresolved anger and that anger cannot vent itself, it can have a direct and crippling effect on sexuality and sexual expression. Repressed anger and loving abandon just don't, be, just don't seem to be able to exist side by side in most cases. You got that? This is like 101 here. Repressed anger and loving abandon have a hard time existing side by side. So when a woman, or a man for that matter, is not happy with the expression of their gender as they show up in the world and in their marriage, there can be this crippling effect. In fact, this uh, therapist recalls the case of one woman who was angry with her husband because he was rarely home. And it could be anger for anything, really, but anything that can't be vented, anything that can't be expressed. And she could not bring herself to confront him about this, about the fact of her anger, and so she developed a vaginal condition which prevented her from having intercourse. It's okay if we get a little bit graphic in this one. Are we there? Is that okay? We've been together long enough. We know that we can do this together. Good. We're an adult group. Um, as soon as she was able to confront him with this and to say, I need you to be home more, or I need to have a fuller expression of my own self as well, her condition vanished, and they were able to resume a sexual relationship that was beneficial and satisfying to both of them. And so this idea that whatever is repressed in our relationships, especially anger, and especially discontent with how the whole gender piece is working itself out in the relationship, that can have a great deal of impact on our sexual functioning and a great deal of impact on our intimacy. And that's why we want to talk about sexual stereotyping and how we can move beyond stereotypes in such a way that our intimacy is deepened and is satisfying, not only in the everyday moments of our lives, but in those beautiful, wonderful moments when we express our, uh, our intimacy through the sexual act. Now, I have a book with me called Gender Babble. Maybe some of you have seen this. It's the dumbest things that men ever said about women. <laughs> And this book captures a few of the stereotypes that have been functioning in our society. And so I want to just read a few of these just to get you in the mood for talking about stereotypes and to begin to feel at a gut level how debilitating these kinds of things can be. Plutarch says that the wife ought not to have any feelings of her own but should join with her husband in his moods. <laughs> that would make it hard to show up as a full person, wouldn't it? Donald Trump says Ivana and I don't have tremendous fights because ultimately Ivana does exactly as I tell her to do. <laughs> Um, she's having a hard time showing up as her true self, I'm sure. 
Um, a meteorologist says that women's logic is one of those contradictory terms like military intelligence. <laughs> and one more, Ralph Waldo Emerson. We love these people, but sometimes if you look under the hood very closely, there's a few things that aren't so pleasant. He says that women should not be expected to write or fight or build or compose scores. She does all by inspiring men to do all. Now, Garrison Keillor reclaims, reclaims the whole situation for us. He says this. He says, girls had it better from the beginning. Boys can run around fighting wars for made up reasons with toy guns going ksh, ksh, and arguing about who was dead, while girls play in the house with their dolls, creating complex family groups and solving problems through negotiating and role playing. Which gender is better equipped on the whole to live an adult life, would you guess? <laughs> There you go. There you just a little little you know wisdom about stereotypes. Well, let's face it, shall we in this moment that stereotypes are a bad thing. They are either insulting or they are at least gross generalizations. And while stereotyping is a natural process that we as human beings engage in, because we do in our minds try to sort out realities, right? And we need to have compartments for things and we can't leave everything wide open, so we do try to sort things out and put things in compartments. And that's a good thing for our brains to do. But when we do that in areas of our lives that are this important and we do it in an, in an unnuanced way, we set ourselves up for a great deal of difficulty because then what happens in the area of stereotyping is then we begin to respond to one another based on our preconceived notions of who each other is or ought to be rather than taking the time and the effort to get to know that person for who they really are and then responding to them in a way that is congruent with who they really are. It used to be that female stereotypes, the woman is sex symbol, the decorative wife, the dutiful secretary. If you think about these things, these are stereotypes that we live with that are very familiar with for us. The powerless victim, you know, the woman is the powerless victim. It used to be that these female stereotypes got all the press. And women have been understandably offended by the fact that they have been reduced to these kinds of limited uh, roles and portrayals. But more recently, men are beginning to understand too that they have been limited by stereotypes as well. Um, Andrew Kimbrell, who wrote the book, The Masculine Mystique, he observes this, and he's writing to men, and he says, we treat women as sex objects, but men are treated as success symbols. You and I, he's addressing his, his um, men, uh, his friends, you and I are taught from the time that we were kids that we had one job and one job alone, that we're going to be judged by our parents, our spouses, and our competitive male peer group by how successful we are. In short, he says, the expectations of popular culture and of most people, that you be strong, successful, powerful, authoritarian, and efficient, these expectations are impossible for us to fulfill. And some of you men feel that way today. You feel weighted down with the expectations of our culture, just like we as women feel limited by the expectations of our culture. Another author who writes in our newspaper locally in Chicago has this to say about his own desire to be released from rigid gender stereotypes. He says, biology is not destiny for men either. He says, our world would be a better place if men could break out of rigid, the rigid roles that we've been taught and if we could be freer to explore different kinds of work and styles of living. Listen to this, this is very poignant. He says, when we get trapped in our work or isolated within ourselves, we risk dying a slow death and taking others with us. So men and women are both de definitely damaged by our tendency, our human tendency to stereotype. And so clearly the problem of gender stereotyping affects both genders. And that's why I want to take some time today to look at a few of the gender stereotypes that hinder our intimacy with one another. Because gender stereotypes prevent us from bringing our true selves to our relationships, right? Like Leanne this morning, she was prevented for many years in their marriage from bringing her full and her truest self. And it, it, it was not only in her marriage, she couldn't even let herself know who she was. Do you see the danger of that? First and foremost, she couldn't even tell herself who she was, let alone tell her husband, let alone tell her family, let alone tell her church that I don't fit. I don't fit the stereotype. And if my spouse believes or if I believe that there's only one way to be a man or a woman, then I can't give my, my true self or receive my true self, and there cannot be the, the possibility of true intimacy. 
stereotypes also magnify the differences between men and women. And there are differences, and I want to let you know that in this talk, I can't cover everything. So let's just assume that there are some differences, okay? <laughs> we have different bodies, we know that, we've heard the research about the brain and all that kind of thing. We know there are some differences. But I would like to say today that stereotyping magnifies our differences rather than helping us to understand that we share a common human experience. And if men and women could understand that we share this common human experience and lean into that and be compassionate towards one another and be understanding and invite the whole of each person to come forward, we would be in a whole different place. Elaine Storkey has this to say that we often hear the comment that women and men are the opposite sex, yet we are more like each other than anything else in creation. Isn't that true? What, is, what if we stood on that reality? We are more like each other than anything else in creation. How would that change us in relation to one another? So stereotypes prevent us from bringing our true selves to our relationships, which is the core of intimacy. Stereotypes magnify our differences and prevent us from sharing the human experience deeply together. And stereotypes ultimately lead to a distortion of truth. The fact is there is usually a grain of truth in every stereotype, and this is one reason why we accept stereotypes so readily. However, stereotypes also exaggerate and overstate the truth to the extent that eventually it becomes an untruth. Now, I'm asking you to just, I know it's late in the afternoon, and that that was a little twist that I just gave you, but I want you to hear that, that there's a grain of truth in every stereotype usually, which is why they go in so deep. It's why we accept them in the first place. But stereotypes overstate and exaggerate the truth to the point that they usually become an untruth. For instance, the idea that all men ever think about is sex. How many of you men like that stereotype? I don't think so. Something in you going, Arr, I don't think so. Well, that is the exaggeration of a truth. I mean, the truth is that most men are very interested in sex, right? That's okay, we can say that. But the stereotype exaggerates this reality to the point that it is untrue because it fails to acknowledge another truth, that men are capable of thinking about other things besides sex. <laughs> My brother, who enjoys mountain biking, is quick to point out that if he were to start thinking about sex as he races down a mountain, he could end up in a ditch, or worse. And he wants to be known as one who is quite capable of concentrating on other things, thank you very much. And he does not appreciate being reduced to this one-dimensional description of who men are. Now, it's bad enough when women believe this stereotype because that affects how we respond to the men in our lives, right? If women believe this stereotype, we are always going to be on guard, we are always going to be self-protective, and always a little bit disdainful of the men that we're dealing with, right? And that doesn't help. It doesn't help a thing for us to think that way. Now, when men start believing it, that's dangerous as well because then they sell themselves short in terms of what they're capable of in terms of the unidimensional or the many dimensional experiences that go with being human. The fact is that women think a lot about sex too. I'm here to tell you. Uh, we may not be stimulated to think about sex by the same things as men are. We might not think the same thoughts about sex that men do. But we think about sex quite a lot because we long for sexual fulfillment as well. We long for sexual expression. And we experience our own desires and we spend time thinking about sex and talking with our friends about sex. And so again, this stereotypical view that all men think about is sex and the distortion of that, not only does it distort who men are, but it helps, to, it obscures the reality of the fact that our desire for sexual expression and intimacy is a shared human experience. Men and women share that experience together here on planet Earth. So those are just three, I think, of some of the most significant reasons why stereotyping is so detrimental to the development of intimacy in a relationship. So that being said, I want to delve into a couple of those stereotypes, and I want to talk about them, and I want to look under the hood, and I want to say, how can we dismantle this one? How can we smash that one? And let's begin with the story of a woman named Nicolette. She talks about the fact that when she was married, she was very naive when she got married. She says, I wanted sex to be something wonderful, and it turned out to be not so great. She used another word, but I'm not going to use that here. I do have, I do have standards. <laughs> um, she says, it didn't stop hurting until after our first child was born, and it sure wasn't fulfilling. 
I was on the pill, and my libido was nothing on the pill. I had no knowledge that being on the pill is like being semi-pregnant. So in terms of hormones, I didn't realize that, that uh, being on the pill would bring a decrease in sexual interest. Nobody told me that. And I thought it was all about me. I thought something was wrong with me. And I was a pretty reserved person. I had been taught to be reserved, and my personality was a little a bit flat, and I just wasn't horny. So I didn't get aroused, and I was orgasmic once I got to the proper stage. But I always wondered what it would be like to want it, you know, before we had it. It seemed like that would be so much fun. And my hope was that I would be as interested in sex as Dave was, and that our appetites would be the same. And the bottom line was that vaginal intercourse was just not that fulfilling or as, or as satisfying as I wanted it to be. And here's, here's something very true. She said, I was so naive, I thought the penis would go through the clitoris. And when I found out that it didn't, I thought God had made a terrible mistake. I thought he had done it all wrong. And I still think he might have arranged it differently. And I plan on asking him about that someday. <laughs> And there were other things, too, like the idea of mutual orgasm. I thought it would come easily, but it took 15 years for us to achieve that. And even at that, I think it was luck. <laughs> she says, our sexual dynamic has been volatile. We'll be doing OK for a while, and then we'll crash, and our true feelings will come out. And one of us will say, I don't like this. And the other one will say, oh, yeah, I don't like it either. And the other thing, I got one more thing to tell you. I want more. And then Nicolette will say, and I, you always want more. Well, then divorce me. Well, I can't divorce you because I love you. And if we never had sex again, I'd still love you. All right, then, let's go on. And all the time, I'd be thinking, I've got to get better. I've got to get better. But there was no better to get, and I was really stuck. And I think Nicolette's comments, and they're honest, and they're a little raw, and I hope that's OK with you. Because at some point, we have to get to the place in the Christian community where we're able to talk about these things and where the Christian community becomes the place where there is true information to be found. And the fact that we don't deal vigorously with sexual issues means that many of us have to go somewhere else, have to go outside the community of faith to find the answers. And so we're a bit on the cutting edge here, and I acknowledge that. But I do it purposefully because I believe that the Christian community needs to be the place where these things can be discussed openly. Because Nicolette's story reflects a lack of information, which is sad. And it also reflects stereotypical views of marriage and sexuality and intimacy that she lived in and with in a very deep way and that made it hard for her to function sexually. Uh, There's a lack of information and a stereotypical view that wasn't helpful to her. First of all, there's this stereotype of men want it and women don't. This is not a helpful stereotype, is it? Because it's just not true. And this is a long-standing and slow-to-die assumption. And there's another assumption that goes with it, and that is that normal women do not enjoy sex as much as men do. This is a stereotype. And this particular stereotype results in a, in a particular way of socializing women and young girls. And they are taught in many ways to suppress their sexuality, to pretend that they don't want it, because they think that that's what it means to be a woman that it's men who want sex and women don't. So how am I to be with this place in me that wants it? What am I supposed to understand about that if the culture or the church is telling me that good women don't want it and that that's the view? Then how am I supposed to be with that part of me that really does, that really is interested? Many women have been socialized to believe that their job is to keep that part of themselves quite under control. And that if there is any kind of interest in that within themselves, that they are somehow less than, that they are not what God created them to be. So for the woman who is interested in sex and is easily aroused, this stereotype can cause a great deal of emotional ambivalence about her sexuality. And let me tell you, the, the Baldwitz were talking last night about how all that stuff that happens when we're young and that happens within our families, how we bring that into our marriages without even knowing it. And the deep early messages that we received about our sexuality and sexual stereotyping, those are in us. And it might be OK in the beginning, but those are going to come back to haunt us. They really will. So we're going to have to look at them and allow them to be raised to our level of consciousness. So for Christian women in particular, we might have to really confront this particular gender stereotype and begin to understand that in God, we too were created as sexual beings, created to want sex and to enjoy it. If we don't begin to accept this part of ourselves and if the men in our lives don't help us, we may begin to use our energies to suppress our normal responses to sexuality. 
So that, that gender stereotype can cause us to begin to suppress something in us that's really, really good. And especially if we are not helped before we're married as girls, if we're not helped to understand that part of ourselves and we're taught only to suppress and never to feel good about that part of ourselves, we bring that into marriage and somehow we expect that we're going to say I do and all of a sudden everything we've turned off, everything we've suppressed, that role that women often take in the relationship of being the one that is the gatekeeper that controls the sexual expression in the relationship, right? Many girls are, are counseled that way in the dating relationship that they're the ones that are supposed to control the whole deal, you know, because men are out of control and can't control themselves, so it's up to us as women, right, to control the whole thing. I remember getting that message when I was young. I remember it. I remember it well, and it's deep. It's deep in there for me, because I was raised in a very conservative Christian household. And so if that is the case, if those are the messages, the light switch doesn't necessarily turn on the minute we say, I do. And that gender stereotype is quite unhelpful. If a woman feels that she's not supposed to enjoy sex as much as a man does, she might be very uncomfortable with her own natural responses during the sexual act. She might have trouble um, opening herself up fully to that and going with what's going, you know, all that it takes to move into an orgasmic response. And so for us uh, as women and for the men who love us, we're going to need to debunk that stereotype and to give ourselves fully to that part of ourselves that was created to enjoy sex just as much as men do maybe a little bit differently, but just as much, so that we don't cut ourselves off from one of the most beautiful things about us. It's a beautiful thing that women were meant to receive men in the sexual act, that we're meant to receive our spouses in the sexual act and to respond fully. In fact, the woman's body is an amazing thing because the only uh, body part that, that I know of, the only physical body part that is meant purely for pleasure is the clitoris. Every other body part that we know of has some other utilitarian function. But we as women have this one place that's meant only for pleasure. And to me, that means that's God saying to us, you know what, I've given you that for your good. I've given you that so that you'll know that you are meant to enjoy it. And so we need to give ourselves over to that. Now, another very destructive stereotype is the idea that men are to be the initiators and women are to be the responders. Have we heard that one? That's very prevalent in the Christian community. And we've extrapolated a lot out of our theology and placed it on the sexual part of ourselves as well. And this stereotype is widespread among Christians because it fits so well with their belief that men should be the leaders and women should follow. Now, unfortunately, this stereotype encourages women to be passive and to allow themselves to be acted upon rather than actively seeking their own pleasure during lovemaking. And this can severely limit our experience with it. The problem with accepting this stereotype is that being active and initiating at least some of the time is the key to women enjoying the sexual experience. And indeed, the scriptures make it very clear that sexual pleasure and re release is a need both for men and for women. The scripture says that a husband should give to his wife what she needs in the sexual act, that uh, he does not have authority over his own body in that sense, that his body belongs to her as an agent of her pleasure and vice versa and we are not to deprive one another in this regard. Uh, Clifford and Joyce Penner have some great works on, on sexuality and talk about the fact that, that women who have trouble experiencing arousal in their marriage relationship need to learn to take responsibility, need to learn to move beyond this stereotypical view and to take responsibility for their own sexual life and for their own sexual pleasure, for telling their husbands what it is that they want and need and what's helpful to them in the sex act. If women begin to do this, begin to take more responsibility for their own sexual lives and for their own sexual pleasure, this can be helpful to men as well because another stereotype in our culture is that men are the sex experts, right? That men know everything. So women come into marriage expecting that their men know everything. The men feel a lot of pressure about needing to perform and needing to do it all, needing to have the whole thing figured out taking responsibility for making sure that it works out for both of us. Sometimes men feel that, we're, that sex is more work than it is fun because they feel so responsible in it. So if a woman can take responsibility for her fun, for the fun, and for showing up and helping her husband know uh, what would be most helpful to her, then uh, the two of them will be in a much better place for sharing this wonderful aspect of their lives together.
I want to just highlight one other um, area of sexual intimacy that I think can be very helpful if we would move beyond stereotypes, and that is this stereotype that men are, emotion are unemotional and strong, and women are nurturing and supportive. We hear that one too, don't we? There is a stereotype out there that men are always strong, that men don't cry, you know, real men don't cry, they don't eat quiche and all that kind of thing, and that women have all this nurturance in them, all this uh, ability to support. And there is perhaps no stereotype that is more damaging to an intimate relationship than this one. Why is that? Because a man who accepts this view will find it difficult to express those common human emotions of vulnerability and deep feeling and doubt. He'll have a hard time learning how to be tender and how to nurture because he'll think that that goes against what it means for him to be a man. It'll be hard to give himself to those pieces of the human experience. He might have the tendency to approach sex as a purely physical act rather than approaching sex as the culmination of the emotional and the spiritual and the physical sharing and openness that his, he and his wife have. And so this will result in a limited kind of experience for both he and his wife. And in addition, if the woman feels that she's the one always carrying the nurturing aspects of a relationship, always the one who is vulnerable, always the one who is emotional, always the one who's carrying the feeling of the relationship, she'll eventually shut down. She'll eventually say, I don't want to be the only one doing this part of the relating. This feels too vulnerable to me. And so we need to recognize that these generalizations are only partial truths based largely on socialization and personality, not based on the truth of who we are in God, not based on anything that is inherently male or female. In my marriage, my husband happens to be the one that is more emotional than I am. And that's been a hard one for him and for me because it's been uncomfortable for him to show up as the one who cries more than I do, the one who feels deeper needs sometimes to be connected with me. That's been hard. And sometimes I've struggled with my feelings of, ooh, I'm not sure he's so strong if he's got so much emotion or if he cries so easily. I'm not sure how I like this. This doesn't fit with what I thought a man needed to be. So part of our journey in our marriage has been for us to come to this place of accepting the fact that the, uh, that his level of emotion is just fine within a man. What it means is he's probably more well-rounded than most, right? And so my challenge is to love him and to support that part of him coming into the full human experience. And his part for me is to love the part of me that's strong and sometimes has a hard time going to that emotional place. So those are a few of the stereotypes. Again, I know that I've been frank with you, but I think at a marriage conference where you all have given your time to come here and to be here with one another and to be alone together, this is a chance for you to work on some of the things that maybe you've had a hard time looking at together, and I hope that you will. So to close, I want to read from Garrison Keillor again, because um, there's one other myth that I want to shatter right now, and that is the myth in our culture that illicit sex is the, be is the, is the best sex. That's what television and the media want to tell us, right? That all the good sex is happening between people who aren't married. That's the message. If people have looked at, that, looked at the statistics and noticed that most of the sex acts that happen on television and in movies happen between people who are not married, which give us the underlying idea that the good sex is happening outside of marriage. And Garrison Keillor has a wonderful, wonderful perspective on that. Um, he says, despite the fact that married people don't always have as much sex as they would like. They are extremely pleased and satisfied with their sex, uh, with their sex lives. There, is, there was a survey done a couple of years ago that demonstrated that married couples are the ones that are the most satisfied with their sex lives. And he says this. He says, this is a lot of pleasure in a country this big. <laughs> the happiest ones are the monogamous couples, married or not, Despite jobs and careers that eat away at their evenings and weekends and nasty whiny children who dog their footsteps, and despite the need to fix meals and vacuum the carpet and pay bills, these couples still manage to encounter each other regularly in a lustful, inquisitive way and throw their clothes in the corner and do thrilling things in the dark and cry out and breathe hard and afterwards lie sweaty together, feeling extreme pleasure. So despite all that you may have read lately, there is an incredible amount of normality going on in America these days, and it is good to know. Our country is not obsessed with sex. To the contrary, we wear ourselves out working. We are surrounded with noise and distraction and all manner of entertainment. We indulge our children as they run roughshod over our lives. 
But considering what the American couple is up against, it's outstanding to think that once a week or once a month, or maybe just on Memorial Day and Christmas, <laughs> or whenever the coast is clear, they are enjoying this gorgeous moment that is, despite its secrecy and long shuddering climax, essentially the same experience as everyone else has had. It is almost work worth all the misery of dealing with real estate people, bankers, lawyers, and contractors to have a home that has a bedroom where the two of you can go sometimes and do this. It is worth growing up and becoming middle-aged to be able to enjoy it utterly. So. I need to pray. I just, I need to pray. Thank you, Lord, for this great gift of our sexuality, and we are grateful and we are thankful. And I just pray that you would help the community of faith to move towards being a place where we can deal vigorously with the, these issues in such a way that we can prove the truth of the scriptures, and that is that the sexual expression beyond stereotypes within the marriage relationship is one of the greatest gifts that we've been given. Thank you so much. Amen. Did you enjoy Ruth Haley Barton's presentation of how biblical equality can move us beyond stereotypes to a full expression of individuality and sexuality within marriage? She does a terrific job of clarifying how our gender roles, sexuality, should be applied in marriage, the church, and society. We recommend that you read her excellent book, Equal to the Task, Men and Women in Partnership. Ruth does a good job of clearing up the quest to understand sexuality. Ruth makes the, the spiritual connection from the physical needs of the flesh to the personal need for love and community connectedness with the spiritual things of God. Listen to what she says about making the connection. I'm going to be reading from her book, Equal to the Task. Um, from a clinical standpoint, sexuality is the entire range of feelings and behaviors with which humans, human beings have and use as embodied persons created male and female. Sexuality is expressed in relationship to ourselves and others through look, touch, word, and action. It includes the combinations of our gender, identity, and role, and sex, anatomy, and physiology. Our sexuality, while connected to all facets of ourselves, is a bodily thing. But sexuality is so much more than just a physical reality. When considered from a psycho-spiritual standpoint, we understand it as our capacity for community and connectedness. Sexuality always leads us beyond the physical stage to a far more personal need. We are driven inexorably into a desire for personal, intimate involvement with another person. The glandular urge, it turns out, is the undercurrent of a need for sharing ourselves with another person. Sexuality throbs within us as a movement toward relationship, intimacy, and companionship. God, who created us out of his own desire for fellowship and intimacy, placed the same capacity and desire within us and said, it is very good. Genesis 1.31. It can also be good again, because God the Father has sent Jesus Christ as our egalitarian connection. Ruth goes on to say, our ability to appreciate the gift of being in the world as an embodied gendered people begins with some understanding and acceptance of the fact that sexuality is not merely some physical impulse contained in a safe box to be let out on special appropriate occasions. Humans are not sexual only when they participate in sexual acts and, ase and asexual at other times. Rather, sexuality is part of our total personality and has at least four dimensions, biological, psychological, ethical, and cultural. We need to allow the realities of creation to sink deeply into our understanding. Um, 
Our differentiation as male and female is very good. The fact that we have the capacity to connect deeply with others and that we have been created with bodies that can express that intimacy in physical ways is very good. Our experience of ourselves as sexual beings is very good. The sexual energy between men and women is very good. Yes, we can take that gift and use it in ways that are contrary to God's intention for the gift, and in so doing, create problems for ourselves and others. But that doesn't mean that the gift has ceased to be good. Ruth says that most of us have arrived at the point where we can accept and perhaps even feel good about sexuality that throbs within us. One is, it is in response to our spouse or spouse to be. Although even then, sexuality can be experienced as more of a problem than anything else. However, if we experience any hint of longing in relation to anyone else, we are quick to clamp down on ourselves with verses like, everyone who looks at a woman with lust, and, looks, and it works the other way around too, has already committed adultery with her in his heart, Matthew 5, 28. Then we wonder why we don't experience sexuality as a gift. We become afraid of it. Uh, Ruth goes on to say, um, one problem with our traditional approach to managing sexuality is that we have failed to distinguish between lust and the stirrings that come from the fact that all the parts of ourselves, spiritual, relational, physical, emotional, are interconnected. The lust to which Jesus was referring in this oft-quoted passage is impulsive and anxiously self-seeking, willing to take whatever it can get. Lust is hurtful and dehumanizing because it reduces people to a single element of their personhood, their sexuality, rather than responding to them as multi-dimensional persons functioning in the context of many relationships and commitments. Lust doesn't care who or what it destroys to get what it wants. Ruth continues, the antidote to lust is love, as Paul points out in Romans 13, 8 through 10. Let no debt remain or stand outstanding except the continuing debt to love one another. For whoever loves others has fulfilled the law. The commandments, do not commit adultery, do not murder, do not steal, do not covet, and whatever other commandment there may be are summed up in this one rule. Love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no harm to its neighbor, therefore love is the fulfillment of the law. When there are sexual sparks in a relationship in which individuals are valued for the many facets of who they are, it is a call to love. The kind of love that would never dream of harming another person or those close to him or her. These sparks generate and finds its expression in a behavior that is loving, respectful, and wise. It can actually become an occasion for being joyful about the fact that we are alive in all the ways that God has made us alive and, has, and causes us to be truly thankful for the beauty he has brought into our lives to other people. The Bible tells us that our bodies are the temple of the Holy Spirit in 1 Corinthians 6, 19. In some unexplainable way, God inhabits our bodies, making them a place where we can meet and know him. Since sexuality is such an important aspect of our bodily selves, this too can become an area of our lives where we meet and know God in unique ways. All of human experience is somehow connected, and all of it holds the possibility for abundant living, for the experience of grace, and for the imprint of the divine. Many spiritually awake people have noticed that our sexual feelings intensify as we are made more complete. Many think that sexuality will go away, or at least become quiescent as we grow, as we grow spiritually. Or, the, or on the contrary, as we abide more closely to the God who is the source of all creative energy, the God of the Incarnation, we begin to experience sexual energy in a new way, as a holy, inalienable, generative force. Ruth goes on to saint, say, we, we must open our longings to God as we begin to wake fully to the spiritual, social, and sexual dimensions of ourselves. We find that they are inseparably intertwined and are not to be compartmentalized, or that is, stereotyped or separated. One of the reasons male-female relationships and the sexual energy within them are so powerful is that they have the capacity to bring us face to face with places in the human soul where the longing of the body, soul, and spirit all come together. 
it is tremendously important that we come to understand, to grow comfortable with, and to live wisely with ourselves as beings who need and desire intimacy with others. Um, Ruth goes on. Um, we need to stop judging ourselves for the desires and capacities that God created within us. But this is hard because we have been taught to be ashamed of such experiences of our humanness. Shame in this context is not helpful. What is helpful is to bring our longings to God. Why? Because opening up to our longings in the presence of God gives us the opportunity to take care of ourselves so that we will not express our sexuality and inappropriate be sexual behavior. Being honest with God keeps us safe in moments when we are vulnerable. We need to cultivate self-awareness, which means taking responsibility for our tr own transformation. I'm come aware of the issues that affect our way of being in the world and taking the initiative to work through them. Ruth goes on to say, none of us are perfectly well-adjusted sexually. We have all, we all have areas where greater insight is needed. It is important to sort through the messages we receive about sexuality when we were young and to understand the patterns that develop in response to these messages. The way in which our need for love, intimacy, and self-esteem have or have not been met throughout our lives influence how we respond to the dynamics of male and female relationships. Unresolved difficulties in our current sexual lives can make us vulnerable to make unwise choices. Cultivating awareness along these lines gives us an expanded range of choices. Rather than being captive to our unconscious needs and desires, we are able to make conscious choices to respond in ways that are life-giving to ourselves and others. Um, we'll continue. We also, Ruth continues, we also need to be aware that men's and women's experience of their sexuality is often very different. In order to honor each other as sexual beings, we will need to listen and to be and be sensitive to each other's needs. Because of cultural stereotypes, women often don't experience themselves as strongly sexual beings and so are not fully awake to their own needs and desires. This can lead them, to, uh, leave them vulnerable to men who awaken those longings and seem capable of filling them. Many women are also unaware of their own sexual energy and how others are experiencing it. So they may find themselves sending messages that they don't wish to send. It would be much safer for women and the men with whom they interact if they acknowledged their sexual power and made more conscious decisions about the messages they wish to, to send. Throughout Jesus' life, he demonstrated a remarkable ability to interact with women in ways that were intimate, comfortable, and life-giving. He was never inappropriate, but he also wasn't prudish or overconcerned with appearances. How healing it is when, like Christ, we are able to fully present, be present in relationships with other genders, with the other gender, while seeing the best in each other and maintaining boundaries. Gretchen Gable and Hull um, has this to say in her book, Equal to Serve. Similarly, both men and women can fulfill roles of leaders, administrators, and teachers in the one Christian body. And again, they will do so in their individual ways. There is no reason to think God intended a mutual uh, ruling or occupational function to be done in a unisex fashion. Men will bring a male perspective and women a female perspective when both minister together in line with their mutual creation in the image of God and in fulfillment of Jesus' prayer in John 7, 20 to 23. 17. John 17, 20 to 23. They will begin to mirror the unity, equality, harmony, and cooperation of the Godhead. I'm going to read that. I do not pray for those alone, but also for those who will believe in me through their word, that they all may be one, as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that you sent me, and the glory which you gave me I have given them, that they may be one 
just as we are one, I in them and you in me, that they may be made perfect in, in one, and that the world may know that you have sent me and have loved them as you have loved me. The, rela the relationship between Jesus and the church may be a mystery to some, but it shows a mutual relationship between Jesus and his bride. Look at Ephesians 5, 25 to 32. It says here, husband, Jesus said here, or Paul says here, Husbands, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her, that he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of the water by the word, that he might present her to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she should be holy and without blemish. So husbands ought to love their own wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. No one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as the Lord does the church. For we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. The idea of two, persons, of two parents is acceptable in bringing proper balance to a family. So if one parent family operates under a handicap, why is the Christian community any different? Why do we accept the imbalance of a one sexual leadership in the church? After all, doesn't the relationship between Jesus Christ and the bride, his bride, the church, show that they both rule in mutuality? Besides this, in uh, 1 Corinthians 3, uh, 16 and 17, and 1 Corinthians 6, 19, it is stated that our bodies are the temple of God's Holy Spirit. See what it says here. Do you not know that you are the temple of God and that the Spirit of God dwells in you? If anyone defiles the temple of God, God will destroy him. For the temple of God is holy, which temple you are. And also uh, 1 Corinthians 6, 19. Or do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God and you are not your own? The church is that building comprised of its members which forms the bride. Then the, and then the church is a place where the Holy Spirit dwells, which is the bride of Christ. The church or bride receives its feminine likeness from the presence of, of rule of the Holy Spirit in her. We need to ask ourselves, if this is so, and, if, and then if Christ recognizes this fact and treats the church so lovingly because of the presence of the Holy Spirit, then men should treat women with the same kind of respect because women are imaging the church or the presence of the Holy Spirit by their feminine attributes. There's a great romance going on here which is shown symbolically by the sexual union or climax that shows Jesus not only gave his life passionately for her, but will return with and will passionately fight for her and rescue her wife, and rescue his wife even as she passionately waits for him by exerting great effort by passionately preaching the gospel before her bridegroom returns. It shows the final climatic end with the start of Christ's rule on the earth as King of kings and Lord of lords with his bride, the church. Look at uh, Revelations 19, 11, 12, and 16. Now I saw open... Now I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse, and he who sat on him was called Faithful and True. In righteousness he judges and makes war. He has eyes like a flame of fire, great passion. And on his head were many crowns. He had a name written that no one knew except himself. And down in verse 16. And he has on his robe and on his thigh a name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. And also Revelation 21.2 talks about the church. John says, Then I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. Remember what Jack and Judith Bellswick said in their book, The Family. Authentic marital sexuality can be achieved only if husband and wife are in agreement about their sexual interaction. There is no room for the misguided view that the husband initiates and dominates while the wife submits in obedience. Both 1 Corinthians 7, 4 to 5 and Ephesians 5, 21 assume mutual desire for and interest in lovemaking. This requires sensitive communication between the couple about their sexual desires. Just as an orchestra plays with one voice, when each instrument contributes its own part and the music is brought together in harmony, so a married couple reaches sexual harmony through communication and sensitive understanding of each other's needs. 
This also shows the symbolic relationship to Jesus and his bride, the church. Ruth Barton has one more thing to say, and we'll read a little bit more. There was a fine line between respecting the power of sexuality and refusing to live out, lie, out of, live out of our fears. It is the line that Christ walked, and it is the line that women and men today need to find together as they move toward partnership. The willingness to move beyond fear and paranoia, but to do so with wisdom and purity, is contrary to what we see in secular culture and also in much of the religious subculture. Celia Allison Hahn speaks for the call for men and women to partner together in the context of biblical community as a call to live faithfully in, and quote, uh, quoted the, the tension of two realities, awareness of our feelings and drives, and also the call to behave in responsible ways. Sexual paradox invites us to live where the currents of energy spark back and forth. People discover new sources of vitality when they hold opposites together in tension. And there was a lot of good energy in male-female collaboration, energy that is one of the most precious gifts of God for the people of God. We hope you enjoyed Ruth Haley Barton's uh, video on sexuality and uh, stereotypes and our references to her book, Equal to the Test, Men and Women in Partnership, and our comments. If you'd like to have more information, write or call Christians for Biblical Equality at the address given at the end of our broadcast. Remember, oneness and mutuality is what God wants from us in our sexual intimacy between one another because it shows Christ's relationship to the church. That relationship revealed to us by our Heavenly Father and the Holy Spirit and Jesus Christ in John 4, 23 to 24, Jesus says, But the hour comes and now is when the true worshipers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father seeks such to worship him in spirit and in truth. In John 16, 13, it says, But when the spirit of truth comes, the spirit shall guide you into all truth. Remember, I am the woman beside this man. And I'm the man beside this woman. And we, we are, are one, one in, in Christ, Christ Jesus. Jesus. So, so long, long for, for now. now. Joy again, set us free.